my name is Sarah Place. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer with Elenco Animal Health, and I'm here today to talk to you about how livestock fit in a sustainable food system. So as we start, sustainability is one of these words that is um, quite uh, a hot topic today in terms of it's thrown around a lot, and it's always questionable, what do people mean when they say the word sustainability? And really, sustainability is quite complex. So it's not just about environmental issues, even though we see that be the main topic of discussion quite often. Sustainability is really about balancing three main areas, right? So the environment is one of those areas, but we also have to consider social issues, everything from animal welfare to uh, cultural issues and people's personal preferences for food in different food types to economic issues, whether that's the affordability of food or the um, how, how uh, our producers are actually making money, right, which is key, and I'll come back to that, but if you're not making money uh, within an agricultural system, it's clearly not very sustainable, right? So all of these different criteria in this list that's on the screen, this Venn diagram type model, is definitely not comprehensive. But it just gives you an idea that we have these different domains of sustainability. We have areas where they overlap, and sometimes things are working in concert, and sometimes we have areas where we have trade-offs, right? real trade-offs between different aspects of sustainability. And that's what makes this issue so complex. Added on top of that, you know, that last bullet point over on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, thinking about how people look at all these different issues, right? We may agree that all these things that are listed on the screen, even if it's not an exhaustive list, they're all important, but how people will value different aspects of sustainability may vary, right? So to one person, uh, animal welfare may be the most important thing, and to somebody else, greenhouse gas emissions may be the most important thing. Neither of those folks are wrong, it's just we have different priorities which again is what makes this such a difficult topic because we are trying to balance the, the needs and wants of so many different folks in the arena. So that said, um, a lot of this topic has been focused when it comes to livestock on environmental footprints and uh, different aspects of environmental sustainability, right? So whether it's carbon footprints or water footprints um, or just the bigger question of should we be eating animal source foods and should we be eating them at the level that we are, et cetera, right? That's really where a lot of this debate comes down to. So with that said, I think it's important to just kind of ground ourselves in some of the data, right? Where are we actually at with regard to consumption of animal source foods, especially meats, right? So what you're looking at here on the screen is information from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization from 1961 to 2013, the per capita meat availability, so just the total amount of primary production available per person in the world, right? So these are global averages. So what you can see clearly are trends towards more monogastric meats globally, right? So we have more poultry meat, mostly chicken meat, some turkey, a lot more pork has been available per person around the world. What's been pretty flat is ruminant meats, right? So whether it's beef or buffalo meat or sheep or goat meat, it's been relatively flat over time, right? So when we say meat consumption is growing, we usually throw a lot of these different categories together. And it is important to make that distinction that it's not growing the same across all the different species or types of meat that are available. Um, the other thing I'll point out is, of course, this is per capita availability, and the disclaimer here is that we've added about 3 billion people, right, in the same time frame of what's on the screen. Um, but again, it's just to give you an idea of how much is being consumed per person uh, globally. So that said, that's the global zoomed out view. What if we were to look just specifically at Canada? Right, so Canadian meat consumption over the same time frame has also slightly increased by about 16% if we were to compare uh, 2013 to 1961. But you can see some, some different trends here happening, and this is actually pretty similar to what we see in the United States and actually a lot of uh, developed countries, right? Whether we're talking in Europe or in North America, where we've had this peak 
of beef consumption in the mid-1970s and then a decline since then, right? So that, again, is pretty consistent with what we see in the United States. Uh, in Canada, pork meat availability per capita has also slightly declined since 1961, but poultry meat is up, right? So again, very similar trends where we see more chicken meat, right? More so-called white meat being consumed in a lot of developed countries and less red meat, right? Um, so I won't go into all the, the ins and outs of nutrition, but it is always interesting of this has been the macro level trend for a lot of developed countries. And, and yet red meat is usually pointed to as, as underlying causing or, or associated with a lot of uh, health ailments, right? Correlation is not causation and negative correlation doesn't mean that there's no effect, but these trends are headed in opposite directions, if you will, in terms of rates of obesity, rates of type 2 diabetes. and red meat consumption per capita in most of, again, the developed world and in the global north. So digging a little bit deeper into this, and there's a lot of info on this slide here, but really some, I'll walk you through it really quick and kind of point out the key takeaway, right? What you're looking at here is 2017 data from the UNFAO. Uh, and these pie charts are breakdowns of what's coming from animal source foods and what's coming from plant source foods. Right, so whether it's meat, milk, and eggs uh, versus all plant source foods, right? So that could be everything from bread to actual fruits and vegetables, right? So in the upper left-hand corner, we have total calories available in Canada, right? So you can see that Canadians, like Americans, like nearly every human population on Earth, eat a plant-based diet if we think about it from a calorie basis, right? So most of the calories in the Canadian food supply are coming from plant source foods. If we go over to the upper right-hand corner, this is protein availability, right? So just grams of crude protein available. Uh, in this case, we have a slight majority coming from animal source foods. In the U.S., it's around 62, 63%. Um, but again, that's a majority. If we look down the bottom left-hand corner, that's the fat distribution. And then on the right-hand side, the right bottom corner, uh, is carbohydrates. So, of course, besides dairy, we don't really have a lot of carbohydrates in animal source foods, so that's dominated by uh, plant source foods. So, why am I putting this information up here? It tells a story kind of in the bigger picture that I alluded to when I, when I said, like most people in the world, you all eat a plant-based diet. And this is, this is kind of highlighting the no-duh uh, aspect of this, is that we are omnivores, right, as a species, and ultimately, I don't see it changing that the majority of calories from on humanity's collective dinner table, if you will, are going to be coming from plants. But what is really critical and where animal agriculture plays a really key role when it comes to macronutrients is protein, right? So protein of, if we think about protein, fat, and carbohydrates, it's the hardest thing for agriculture to make, right? It's the macronutrient that's always in least supply, Right. We have made agriculture really good at producing energy, at producing calories, whether it's in fat or whether it's in carbohydrates. And protein is really, really key, right, for human functioning and flourishing. And so I think that's been something that's been missed in terms of how we talk about this and its relative complementary nature, right, with, with plant source foods. And of course, uh, animal source foods are a protein source that brings a whole bunch of micronutrients with them. Right, whether it's vitamin B12 to essential fatty acids, choline, whatever it may be, that's also really key in this whole discussion as well. And related to that, I'll, I'll talk about this real quick before I get into some of the major uh, issues regarding sustainability that come up again and again with, with regard to livestock. There's a lot of information on this slide too, but this is, this is an infographic, part of an infographic from the livestock lab based at University of Florida. And it's related to what I was just saying is that animal source foods are really, really important for human well-being, right? And we maybe don't talk about them in that way as much, especially in the developed world, just because we often hear conversations about people eating too much. And I won't go into that, but it's questionable what the boundaries are for that definition, right? But with regard to uh, the reality for most of the world is people are not eating enough animal source foods. Right, and we see that manifested in some of the health outcomes. So it's in small font, but right at the top, the key stat on this whole slide is that globally, nearly one in four children under five is stunted. 
right? So they're not reaching their full capacity, both from a cognitive perspective and from a physical perspective. And that's not completely caused by nutrient supply, but it's partially caused by that, right? And we know that animal source foods, we've seen a lot of research, whether it's eggs, whether it's meat, uh, really provide a boost to children. Doesn't matter where they are in the world, but we have a lot of children that are lacking animal source foods, right? So this does come down to uh, really a social justice if you, issue, if you will, in terms of making sure we have enough high quality nutrition available for people around the world. And high quality nutrition is food that come from, comes from livestock, right? And that, that just needs to be emphasized for folks that that is, that is the case. So that said, the rest of this presentation, I'm going to kind of go through what you could almost say is the greatest hits of some of the things that are talked about with regard to livestock production and sustainability, usually used as proof points of why livestock are not sustainable, right? And I just want to provide some more context in each one of these areas and kind of illuminate these issues because they're all complex and they sometimes get uh, sloganeered down to just kind of a bumper sticker statement uh, that you often see repeated in, in the mainstream media. So the first of these issues is regarding feed food competition. So the idea of animal feed, human food competition. And the idea essentially that livestock are stealing food from the mouths of babes, right? So if we want to address food security issues, like I just outlined on the previous couple of slides, the best way is to just all go plant-based, right? So we see that, artic that the argument rolled out quite a lot. And it's not a new argument. It's something that's been um, out there for quite some time. Um, but it's, it's gained traction in recent, in recent times as well. So let's dig into that a little bit, right? If we're going to talk about the competition, potential competition of animal feed and human food, we need to know what are animals actually eating, right? And this is uh, information from the UNFAO, a, gl a global perspective of the global feed ration for livestock. So over on the right-hand side, that pie chart is the breakdown of what all livestock eat. So 6 billion tons of dry matter, 86% of that is not in direct competition with human food, right? Stuff that you and I would not be consuming directly, right? It's forage crops, it's byproducts, it's cotton seed, other things that are really considered human inedible, right, materials. So that's really critical to this whole discussion, right? And it's, it's very self-evident to folks that are in the livestock industries that you don't want to be sticking your head in the trough for most of what animals are eating. But again, because this is an argument that's made, it is important to pay, point out this basic fact. So that 86% is for monogastrics, for ruminants. If we dig in a little deeper, it's actually a higher percent of the animal's diet that is not in competition with human food for ruminants. And that probably makes sense, right? Uh, pigs and chickens, as omnivores, they do eat foods that are potentially more in competition with human food. And we see that also reflected in some of these stats are on the left-hand side of the screen, right? When we think about land use, and land use for growing cereal grains that actually directly go to livestock. In total, it's about 31% of all the cereal area in the world, so it's not an insignificant amount of land. Uh, but you can see the split there. It leans heavier towards the monogastric species, right? Because those animals are gonna be tending to eat more grain as compared to ruminants on a global basis. Uh, and that's why we have ruminants, right? They're, they're really good at converting that human inedible stuff to high quality protein. But ultimately, that's what livestock are for, right? So that last statement over on the left-hand side, I mean, that's kind of, the again, a no-duh type statement, but something that has been missed in a lot of this conversation is the reason we even domesticated livestock. One of the key reasons that we did is that they upgrade plants, right? Plants that either we cannot eat directly, or of course, a lot of these cereal grains that these livestock are eating are not quality uh, feeds that we're going to want to eat as people right? Uh, whether it's just from truly the nutritional quality of those grains or even just from the eating experience, right? Most people would rather eat bacon uh, than a corn soy mix, right? For sure. And that's one of those things that, again, is a basic fact, kind of gets lost, but it's really key in terms of why we have livestock within our food system. What's also key on this land use point is that things aren't static, and I'll come back to this even on the animal performance side, but things change over time, and that changes essentially the land area required to feed livestock. So what you're looking at on the screen here, there's a lot of information, but this is all from the USDA, and this is a US-centric view. 
but it would be similar across many countries in the world as we've seen advancements in crop genetics, crop science, crop yields overall, right? So on the top, we're looking at feed and residual corn use in the United States, okay? And we're comparing the year 1975 to 2017 and then the percent change. So you can see that over that time frame, we have had an increase in the amount of corn that's going to feed all livestock in the U.S., so a 52% increase. However, when we look down to the next row, right, corn yields and bushels per acre, that's increased 104%. So hopefully that makes sense. We've essentially uh, decoupled our feed use, our total feed use from the land required, because when we look down to that third row, right, the actual amount of corn acres that are solely dedicated to feeding livestock has declined 26%, even though we're feeding 52% more to all of our livestock species. At the same time, that final row on the bottom, right, just the total amount of animal source food that gets generated in the U.S. has increased 95% in the same time frame, right? So we're producing more food, more high-quality food for people. We're actually using less arable land as it goes to corn that is going to feed all those different livestock species. So that's really the power of productivity, and I'll come back to that later. Productivity itself is not sustainability, but it is a key part, especially as we continue to have a growing world population and increased demand for animal source foods. So I've talked a lot about food and the quality of the nutrition that's provided for, from livestock, but we have to think about the bigger picture too, in that livestock are more than just food, right? In terms of the value that they provide to human beings and they provide to broader society, right? So they provide byproducts, whether it's pharmaceuticals to clothing, right? Leather to wool, um, those are photosynthetic fibers, right? We don't really talk about it that way, but that's what they are. Um, they provide fertilizer, they provide nutrient cycling uh, within our agro ecosystems, right? In terms of that cycle of consuming feed and using manure back on the land and, and soil health, etc. They upcycle waste products and byproducts, and I'll come back to this more later. Uh, they provide fuel in lots of parts of the world, right? Cow dung is an important fuel source. It's an important building material. They provide livelihoods for over a billion people around the world. They're a huge source of culture, whether in this country, in Canada, all over the world, right, in terms of how important and culturally significant these livestock are to our society, again, to our social fabric. So I put this up here because that is really, really key in this whole debate as well. It's not just simply about objective facts. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of different tentacles, if you will, of how livestock intersect with our society and why they're so important from a sustainability perspective, from a social perspective. So now I'm gonna kind of dig in a little bit more to this topic that's probably the one that gets the most attention with regard to livestock and sustainability, and that's the greenhouse gas contribution of livestock production. Right, so this is really key in terms of the whole debate, and it seems like even now with a pandemic and with lots of things happening in the world that are very important, we still seem to get a whole bunch of news articles about uh, how livestock contribute to climate change. So let's ground ourselves a little bit again in some facts and some of the government data. If we look at agriculture and animal agriculture specifically in Canada, and we look at the official greenhouse gas emission inventory from Canada, about four and a half percent of Canadian greenhouse gas emissions come from livestock agriculture, okay? Um, so you can look at this pie chart breakdown. This is similar to the percent breakdown in the U.S. Obviously, just our emissions are much greater in the United States, but the majority of emissions in Canada are actually coming from fossil fuel combustion, fossil fuel related activities, right? Whether it's getting them out of the ground or combusting them for all the different uses that we have for them in society. Agriculture as a total is about 8.4% uh, in Canada, right? So that would be adding in all crop production, right? On top of that livestock number. So the key takeaway here is not nothing, it's not zero, but it's also definitely not the majority source, right? And sometimes we see inflated statistics that are rolled out, some that are just completely incorrect. And sometimes what happens is global percentages and statistics get applied to specific countries and that can kind of uh, misrepresent the situation within each geographic region. So this stuff gets complicated, right? And this is why I think there's so much confusion about 
greenhouse gas emissions in livestock because there's lots of different percents that are floating out there. And as I just alluded to, sometimes they're specific to certain regions, different points of time, different species. And this makes the whole thing really confused, right? So hopefully I won't add further confusion to this, but kind of walk through how some of these things can be sliced differently. Um, and it kind of comes back to the whole idea of, you know, there's lies, damned lies and statistics, right? And this is definitely one of those areas where we've seen a lot of, again, different numbers thrown out there and it's confusing to know what to cite. So as an attempt to kind of help clarify some of these things, what I have on the screen here are emissions as they were in 2010, according to both the IBCC and UNFAO and kind of walking you through how these things break down uh, in different ways, okay? So we see differences in statistics based on, again, as I alluded to, whether it's global, regional, or at a national level. If we're talking about all livestock versus specific species like dairy cattle, for example, or if we're talking about direct emissions, which in the case of livestock are any emissions that come from the animals themselves in the manure versus adding in all feed production, associated land use change, transportation, all the rest, right? So that's part of the reason why we have so many different statistics out there. What you're looking at on the screen, on the far left-hand side, the size of this bar on the far left is just going to be a visual representation of what emissions were in 2010, right, which is the latest IPCC report number. So in 2010, human-related activities were responsible for 49 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalents in the world, right? So that's a big number, 49 billion metric tons of CO2 equivalents. Of that 49 gigatons, 85.5% were not related to animal agriculture, okay? So the majority was, again, associated with fossil fuel burning, other crop production, et cetera, right? Uh, industries, all those different things are, are lumped in that 85%. 14.5%, so if we look at that next bar over in purple, right, was associated with livestock. And this is a life cycle assessment number, right? So this is actually taking into account the feed production for global livestock, any land use change. So for example, in South America, that's associated with livestock production is all added into this. So it's a in very inclusive number at 14.5%. So that's the global figure. All chickens, buffaloes, everything is thrown in that category. If we were to take that number down a little bit further and just to again illustrate that this is different depending on what species we're talking about, if we were to look at beef and dairy cattle of that 14.5%, Globally, dairy is responsible for about 3% and beef is responsible for about 6%. Okay, so cattle together about 9% of global emissions. So that's what that third bar over is. And if we go to the far right, that little sliver there, that's to give you an idea of what is the North American, right, such as Canada, United States, what is our contribution in terms of our beef and dairy industries to the global percent of greenhouse gas emissions? you can see it's about 1%, right? So about 1% of emissions come from all Canadian and American beef and dairy cattle uh, in the year 2010. So again, it's not nothing, but it's also not a huge percent, right? So hopefully that makes sense. And I'll come back to this later, but we have to keep that absolute contribution in our minds and in that frame of reference, because any difference that we can make, right, in terms of the grand scheme of things is relatively small with regard to what we can do in the North America. Not that we shouldn't be working on it, we should, uh, but it's not the major player in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a lot of information on this slide too, and this is kind of info overload, but this is coming from the UNFAO, and it, it's a great report that was put out in 2013 called Tackling Climate Change Through Livestock, and this is where that 14.5% and all those numbers on the prior slide that I was showing you come from. And this just provides a little bit more detail on how variable things are around the world, right? Um, so what we're looking at on the left panel, right, is the actual greenhouse gas emissions that come from different regions of the world. And the different colors on the bars are the different species, the different main categories of livestock products. So we have small ruminants, goats and sheep, chicken, pork production, cattle milk, and beef, okay? And then on the right-hand panel, the same color scheme in terms of those different products, and what we're looking at is how many millions of tons of protein come from those different species, right? So the size of the bar is relative in terms of 
what is this contribution, both to the human nutrition contribution and the greenhouse gas emissions, right? So again, I just told you 1% for North American beef and dairy. If we were to add in all our poultry and pork production, everything else in there too, North American livestock production emits essentially about 1.4% of global emissions, right? And we are a significant contributor in terms of global protein. So if you kind of look over there proportionally, our contribution to uh, protein production is, is bigger than our contribution to the greenhouse gas emission whole, if that makes sense, right? And that really comes down to the productivity of livestock production in North America relative to other parts of the world. And that's one of our huge opportunities in the rest of the world is to improve the productivity of livestock production, whether it's reducing the incidence of disease, improving the genetics of livestock, all different ways that we can do that. But that's one of our huge opportunities of how are we going to feed more people and put less stress on our natural resources, right, is to decouple those things, just as I provided those examples with corn production in the United States. So just emphasizing how big of a deal productivity is and what, what kind of historical changes have taken place already um, with regard to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we'll look at the Canadian dairy industry and some data just from the UNFAO, okay? So we're comparing here 1961 to 2017. In terms of the total dairy cattle inventory that's within the country of Canada, greenhouse gas emission intensity, which is just saying, what are the CO2 equivalents come from milk production uh, per kilogram of milk, okay? And then the total milk production in the human population, right? So a quick glance at this, you can see that the intensity, the greenhouse gas emission intensity of milk production has dra dropped dramatically in Canada, right? So 68% reduction in the amount of greenhouse gases per unit of milk. And yet milk production is roughly the same. Right, so what does that mean? It means your total emissions in Canada from dairy cattle have gone down, and that's really been driven by that top row. You just have fewer cattle. You have fewer cattle, but they make more milk per animal, and so that means more human nutrition generated for that growing population in Canada and elsewhere in the world with fewer resources required, right? So this is a pretty dramatic example in terms of reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, and this is what's taking place without us really even focusing on it. So I think in the future, we have a lot of opportunities to further drive down greenhouse gas emissions now that we have a lot of research that's actually dedicated to this, and it's not just a ancillary side benefit, if you will, from just improving productivity for economic reasons, which is why this has changed over time. So what's really key here is, especially with beef and dairy cattle, all of our ruminant livestock species, we've seen a lot more attention on them probably than our pork and uh, poultry production when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. And the key driver there is because ruminant livestock emit methane naturally from their digestive systems, right? So I say the key takeaway from this, this whole presentation, if you only take one thing away, is that it's cow burps, it's not cow farts, right? We see this repeated over and over again in terms of uh, folks talking about cow flatulence, I think, just because it sounds funny, right? But most of the methane that gets emitted from livestock, ruminant livestock, comes from the front end of the animal. So, of course, ruminant animals have that, that symbiotic relationship with millions, trillions of microbes within their rumen. Some of those microbes are called methanogens, and they're essentially a key part of the whole rumen ecosystem. They take CO2, hydrogen gas, and they make methane. And about once a minute, that methane gets removed from the animal's mouth through a process called eructation. What's key that a lot of folks, especially uh, in, in the lay public, don't really understand and they have backwards in their mind is actually when we feed more forage and more fiber containing materials, methane emissions are higher from livestock, right? So sometimes you hear people say, well, what if we fed them a quote unquote more natural diet on grass only? Methane emissions would actually be higher per unit of feed intake in that case as compared to when we feed cattle uh, total mixed rations that contain concentrate feeds, contain grains. So more fermentable carbohydrates, less methane emissions, right? And this really comes down to the fact that methane is a loss of feed energy. So there's an incentive here to reduce methane, hopefully, and capture more of the feed energy within the animal and lose less of it to the atmosphere. Why methane is so important is because it is the majority of emissions, whether we look at beef or dairy, or again, sheep or goat production, it's the vast majority of those emissions, right? If you take the enteric methane out of beef, for example, it gets the carbon footprint of beef, it gets pretty close to pork, 
right? So it's a big reason why when we when we hear uh, people compare these different meats that beef, especially beef and lamb, have higher carbon footprints because of methane. So this is getting a little into the weeds, but it's actually really important because there's been a lot of new research on methane emissions and how we account for methane emissions and how they contribute to warming that is really, really important in this whole discussion of livestock sustainability, right? So this infographic on the screen is something that I've made that's a little simplified, but hopefully will make sense as we walk ourselves through it. What you're looking at on the left-hand side, the basics that we all know, right? Sunlight plus CO2 in the air and the beauty of photosynthesis, right? Plants are able to capture carbon out of the atmosphere and fix it into carbohydrates, right? Mostly uh, glucose, many units of glucose and cellulose being the key abundant organic compound that's out there in the world. What happens when cattle eat grass or any other plant material, right? They consume those carbohydrates, that carbon. They, of course, retain a lot of that carbon in themselves in the form of meat or milk. They emit carbon when they respire, just like you and I are doing in terms of CO2. They emit some of it in their urine and some of it in their feces. And then a small fraction of that carbon from cattle gets emitted as methane, right? So methane is one carbon and four hydrogens. So hopefully that makes sense as you look at this on the screen and you look at this methane molecule. This carbon that was in methane was pretty recently in the atmosphere as CO2, right? What takes place with methane is over the course of about 10 years, 10 or 12 years, most of the methane that gets emitted from any source, whether we're talking cattle or whatever it is, gets broken down or oxidized into CO2 again, okay? So the key thing on here, one of the key things on this, this diagram is this is essentially part of the natural biogenic carbon cycle, right? In terms of if we took that cattle and we swapped it out for a mule deer, a white-tailed deer, a moose, whatever it is, it's just acting to cycle carbon through the system and it's temporarily converting carbon to methane. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now methane is a potent greenhouse gas. I don't want to downplay that, right? It is actually a lot more potent than CO2 at trapping heat in the atmosphere. And this is really key to this whole discussion is what we usually do is take methane and say, what is this warming potential as compared to CO2 over 100 years? And hopefully that makes sense as you're looking at this diagram, one uh, kilogram of methane emitted from a cattle, cattle today is not gonna be around in 100 years, right? Um, and so this time scale challenge that we've had and the fact that essentially methane is what we call flow gas has meant that the 100 year global warming potential that's been standard and is in a lot of the data I've already showed you is a bit flawed in linking methane emissions to warming, okay? So I'll emphasize this a little bit more on the, on the coming slides, but essentially you can think about this as a concept of like a bathtub, right? If we have water going into a bathtub and coming out of a bathtub at about the same rate, the water level on the tub is not going to change that much. And what the equivalence is here is the concentrations of methane in the atmosphere. That's really what matters, right? Uh, and we know, at least in the North American cattle industry, the cattle herd has not been growing. It's been slightly declining over time, right? So we're not adding more methane to the atmosphere. We're not essentially overwhelming the oxidative capacity that would be required to oxidate and get rid of that methane, if that makes sense. So again, it's complex, but I'll expand on this in the coming slides. The last thing I wanna emphasize on this slide though is the difference between that and fossil fuels, right? On the right-hand side of the screen, when we burn fossil fuels, it's old photosynthetic carbon Right, it's carbon that was locked up in the Earth's crust for 100, 200 million years. We've burnt half of all the fossil fuels that we have burnt in the last 40 years on planet Earth, right? It's given rise to an abundant supply of energy and a lot of things that we enjoy as people, like being able to do a remote webinar, right, over the internet. But it's also resulted in a lot of carbon uh, going into the atmosphere, right? So some of that carbon has been taken up by oceans, and that's been essentially... Uh, this process of ocean acidification you may have heard about. Some of the carbon has been taken up by land sources. We've had a slight global greening actually in the last several years. It's been picked up by satellite data, but the balance has gone to the atmosphere. It's got to go somewhere, 
right? It's the conservation of mass, right? We have more carbon entering the system. It's got to end up somewhere, and it's in, a lot of it has ended up in the atmosphere. We see a very strong correlation between carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere and fossil fuel burning, and that has been the main driver of anthropogenic or human-caused climate change. So back to this methane concept, right? Again, the short-lived gases like methane, the 100-year global warming potential is just not a very good metric when we want to link emissions to warming, right? And the effect on temperature change. And the reason that's so important is because whether it's the Paris Climate Accord or others and other targets that specific countries are setting, they really are based around temperature targets, right? Usually two degrees C uh, relative to pre-industrial times, right? So if we want to hit a certain temperature target, we need to be thinking in the, the effects of how can we manipulate emissions, we reduce emissions to stay within those bounds of these temperature targets that we're setting. So what's key here is that uh, this group at Oxford and others have really done some great work in terms of emphasizing this and coming up with new metrics, not just global warming potential 100, but using a new metric called GWP star to calculate carbon dioxide warming equivalents instead of just CO2 equivalents. And it makes a big difference, right, in terms of how we think about this issue, especially with enteric methane from livestock in developed countries where we've had essentially declining herds across the board uh, in many developed countries. So just as an example here, and there's a lot of, a lot of numbers on the screen, but what you're looking at is a 20-year time horizon. Again, this is from UNFAO data. And the top row is just comparing, you know, what are the, the trends in enteric methane in that database from the UNFAO? And in 1997 to 2017, we've seen a decline in enteric methane emissions from beef and dairy cattle in Canada, okay? Um, and that's not surprising because you heard it's gone down, right? So you have fewer cattle, you have fewer methane emissions. If we do CO2 warming equivalents, the traditional way that we uh, calculate these emissions, and that's the second row, right? You can see that, you know, yeah, emissions have declined, right? But you're still emitting uh, 14,300 gigagrams of CO2 equivalents per year, right? So within this framework of we want to minimize warming, minimize emissions, you're going to want to dramatically decrease that more, right? The question is, does that drop in CO2 equivalents really mean what we think it means with regard to its effect on warming? And really the answer is no, right? Because it's not really reflecting what's happening, which is your drop in methane emissions from cattle in Canada has, if we drew a box around the Canadian continent, right, has contributed to a slight cooling effect in terms of that system alone, right? Cooling slash not warming, right? Uh, which gets a little confusing, but you're not contributing to warming when you're cutting your emissions. So if we use this new metric of CO2 warming equivalents right in the bottom, and we compared 1997 to 2017. In 2017, you admitted negative 8,000 gigagrams of CO2 warming equivalents, right? A negative number here, again, means you're not contributing to warming, you're contributing to a cooling effect. Again, this is a complex uh, topic, but the main thing that it drives home is this is just another emphasis. It's not just if we think about carbon sequestration, but it's also cutting methane emissions uh, and documenting this progress, so livestock industries can really show that they are part of the climate solution, okay? And that's really the take home from all of this, is this is not saying a get out of jail free card for livestock production, but these better metrics that better reflect reality highlight how livestock production can be a part of the solution. If we further cut methane emissions, we can really show how within countries, within regions, livestock production is potentially being uh, a key contributor to meeting some of these temperature targets and hopefully creating space for further reductions on the fossil fuel side, which again is the main driver of anthropogenic climate change. So all that said, I'd like to finish up here real quick with a little bit on dietary change. And really, as I alluded to in the beginning of this presentation, this is where a lot of the focus has been with regard to sustainability. And there's essentially an underlying assumption here that we cannot improve livestock production enough with our growing world population. We're going to have another uh, 2 billion people in the next 30 years that are going to join us on planet Earth, and they're going to have increasing incomes, which is a good thing. Uh, hopefully, higher quality standards of, of life and living, uh, and that usually means more animal source food consumption, right? So there's been an argument out there 
essentially that we need replacements, right? Because there's no way that animal agriculture can meet that challenge. And I would argue that's what's behind a lot of these newer generation uh, so-called plant-based burgers and other products, alternative and imitation products that are out there. This is not a new concept, right? The idea of coming up with alternatives to meat, but what is new is the focus on sustainability in their marketing materials, right? So whether we were to look at impossible foods that has claims out there that they're going to eliminate livestock by 2035, right, which is just kind of a trolling statement, I think, for animal agriculture, or if we're to look at Beyond Meat's marketing materials, and that's what's in the top right-hand corner of the screen, they argue that they're going to improve human health, positively impact climate change, address global resource constraints, and improve animal welfare, because of course they're not killing animals, so they're improving animal welfare, right? So I put this on here just to highlight that these products, for the most part, they're not marketing based on taste, and they're usually a more expensive product. They're marketing squarely based on sustainability issues. And a lot of the things I've just talked about, feed food competition, saying we're too, using too many resources, we're contributing to climate change, right, et cetera, et cetera. And just to point out on this slide, the CO2 on the Beyond's marketing materials, right, it's a CO2 superscript, and that's actually incorrect. That's not the chemical formula for or uh, <laughs> for carbon dioxide, but it kind of highlights, again, this is all purely marketing, right? And I think we've seen a lot of that enthusiasm from investors because they're directly hitting the topics of today, right? I would say this has happened because animal agriculture has done a very poor job of highlighting some of those historical changes that I've just shown. I, we have not talked about our climate successes or talked about what our future vision is in, in large part. That's beginning to change now. And I think that's what needed, needs to change to really highlight why these substitution products, they're not really a solution at all. They're going to be a very small piece of the pie. What we really have to do is keep improving production. Just to drive this home, this is, I'm sure people saw many of these photos on social media during, especially the early days of this COVID crisis, when people ran on grocery stores and they bought what they could, a lot of what people bought was meat, like real, real meat, not plant-based meat. So this is a photo shared with me from a, from a colleague at, in Michigan, uh, the U.S. state of Michigan, and, and what he saw there. Again, completely anecdotal. I saw the same thing, though, in grocery stores. A lot of the plant-based was left over, right? And we've subsequently seen a lot of data. We've obviously had a lot of challenges in supply chains with, with meat production in the United States and other places around the world. But what we've consistently seen is at grocery stores, at retail, meat consumption or meat sales um, and dollar value has been really, really strong. And even though plant-based has also increased as a percent of the market share, it hasn't really changed at all, right? So again, I highlight this to just say the current trends look like plant-based is not going to be a big, big player, at least in the near term, right? So our challenge is let's improve the production of animal source foods, right? Reality is most people are going to continue to be omnivores. So let's meet people where they're at and make better, higher quality uh, food for people. And just to emphasize why, <laughs> essentially, you can't eat your way out of climate change. This is a really great study. It's a U.S. perspective, but it, it just kind of puts a little bow on all these things I've talked about before and how complex this whole discussion is. So these two animal scientists looked at a scenario that's completely unrealistic, but it puts an upper bound on this whole discussion with regard to sustainability and especially dietary change and, and climate change, okay? So they looked at the scenario, in the U.S., what if every single American, every human and every cat and dog in America becomes a vegan? What would that do to greenhouse gas emissions, right? So they found it indeed would reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. by about 2.6 percentage points. And I put in parentheses there what that is equivalent to globally, less than one half of 1%, okay? But what this would mean is some serious trade-offs, right? We would have slightly fewer greenhouse gas emissions. We would actually produce more pounds of food, and we would be able to produce more calories, right? But the U.S. food supply and the Canadian food supply, right, we don't have a calorie deficit in our food supplies. Uh, we probably have too many calories available, right? And that's part of our challenge currently is a lot of nutrient-poor calories are available. Um, but we wouldn't have as enough essential micronutrients with specific regard to things like vitamin B12, right? So vitamin B12 is essential, but it's only found in animal source foods, right? So if we have no animal source foods in our food supply, we have no vitamin B12, right? And that's key for functioning of all human beings, for cognition. It would not be a good scenario, right, to not have vitamin B12 in our food supply. 
So again, that highlights a really key trade-off that it's not very simple, okay, in terms of how these things work. Again, this is an extreme case, a complete removal of all animals, right? And on the right-hand side, this is looking at the greenhouse gas emissions in these two different scenarios, plus animals is our current situation of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, and minus animals is this essentially vegan world where we have no animal agriculture at all. And what's key is most folks assume that blue chunk of emissions that come from animal ag, if we get rid of animal agriculture, well, we just get rid of all those emissions. But we had to think about what the consequences of getting rid of animals are. As I mentioned earlier, livestock are more than food, right? They're also a source of fertilizer. And so if we get rid of animal manure, we're going to have to add in more synthetic nitrogen to help drive the whole agricultural system. We're going to have to grow more legumes, both for the nitrogen require, requirements of, of crops and soils, but also because we're going to have to eat a lot more beans, right, to meet our protein requirements as people. So there's consequences with regard to nitrous oxide emissions, which is a potent greenhouse gas when we do that. And the key thing I'd just say here is this, this is, again, it's unrealistic, but it's the most extreme case, right? So this is all livestock in the United States disappearing. Right? We snap our finger, a Thanos snap, and they're all gone, right? We have one final giant barbecue, and then they're all gone, right? And again, that is a very unrealistic scenario. We can't have any bison replace cattle in this situation because I would just add back methane, on and on and on, right? So I highlight this to say, think about this critically, right? If this is a scenario with all livestock disappearing, what happens if people slightly shift their diets or one person decides they're gonna go meatless Mondays? Again, people can do what they want from a food perspective, but it's just really not gonna make much of a difference in the grand scheme of things, whether you eat tofu every day or steak, quite frankly, because it's just not a major contributor in the grand greenhouse gas emission budget. The other key thing here is when we think about uh, this scenario that we just talked about on the previous uh, slide in that study, everything is interconnected in agriculture. And I think it's, again, very self-evident for those that are in agriculture. But when these discussions happen on the outside, sometimes people talk about these things in a very binary way of there's plants and then there's animals. But of course, plant and animal agriculture are completely intertwined, right? So we can think about cattle feed, of course, being completely dependent upon animal agriculture, right? Uh, but plants depend on animal ag too, right? Whether it's, again, this fertilizer source and nutrient cycling services, we're talking about grasslands and rangelands that usually these plants depend upon some sort of disturbance, both through the grazing ruminants and other human influences like fire, for example, um, and all the byproduct feeds that come from processing plants, right? We do not eat 100% of plants, even the main crops that we grow, and what's going to happen with those leftovers if we don't use them in animal agriculture, right? So again, it's more thinking about these linkages between plant and animal ag, right? In fact, they all depend on healthy soil. And what can we do to strengthen those and essentially minimize leakages, if you will, of both energy and nutrients that are currently happening in our system and make it stronger? So it's not about getting rid of one or the other, but rather what can we do to enhance these connections and make it a more tight system, if you will. And just to drive this home, we think about the interchange between plant and animal ag. I think it's a great little anecdotal example. We think about three, you know, common breakfast beverages and how they're connected, right? So we have orange juice, almond milk, and the original plant-based milk, aka milk, right? Uh, how are they connected? We were to think about this, especially from a California and the United States example, where all these things are in abundance, right? What often happens is in the growing of both almonds and uh, oranges for juicing, we get byproducts, right? So key one for almonds is almond holes and citrus pulp. And these are pictures I've taken on a California dairy. And what often happens, they get all mixed together. They get part of that cattle casserole that we call a TMR. And we feed those to the, the cattle that actually convert it into milk, right? So again, it's not either or. It's thinking about how these things are connected. As that stat says on the bottom, the global average for every 100 pounds of human food that comes from crops, 37 pounds of byproducts get generated, right? So that is a lot of material that we can use in animal agriculture and use in a sustainable manner because we have livestock to upcycle waste and convert what would be waste into something of worth. So one last thing, this is tongue in cheek, but just thinking about some of these meat uh, alternatives, right? Uh, and thinking about how folks frame this and how they, they garner attention and investor interest. 
I would just put to animal agriculture that we have really cool ways to tell some of our stories that we're maybe not doing, right? And again, this is, this is with tongue in cheek. But if we were to think about even just beef, for example, we already have a really amazing technology that converts plants that are inedible plants into really high quality protein, right? So essentially it converts solar energy into food, right? Pretty amazing stuff. And it's a technology that's actually mobile and able to harvest all the solar energy without having to burn fossil fuels. That's pretty neat, right? And while it's doing this harvesting, it actually produces a high quality fertilizer that feeds soil while it's doing it. Again, no burning of fossil fuels. And then on top of that, this technology self-replicates, right? It's pretty amazing. And of course, it's called cattle, right? <laughs> or, or swap out any ruminant animal, right? Uh, so we can say again, tongue-in-cheek beef, it's the original plant-based protein. And we maybe don't talk about what our livestock do, whether they're pigs or chickens or cattle, uh, in a way that really frames it for people. And that's, that's what agriculture is, right? It's a carbon capture industry. It's a solar energy powered industry. And we're just using livestock as a medium to do this in a really efficient manner when you think about what they're able to convert, things that are not in competition with human food into high quality foodstuffs and other products for us. So wrapping all this up, this is a lot of information, but just to give you an idea that sustainability is complex, but what it comes down to is balancing these three main areas, the environment, social considerations, and economic considerations. That balance is not going to be the same for every operation. It's going to change over time because we're trying to get better over time, right? And new issues are going to arise that we're going to have to throw in the mix to think about. So if you're one of those folks that was hoping this issue of sustainability is going to go away, bad news, it's not, right? It's going to be with us for the long haul. What's really key is continuously improving, right? In all these different areas, whether it's animal welfare or environmental efficiency, getting better over time is what's really critical for sustainability. Livestock, they produce nutrient-rich food, right? But they produce more than food. They're incredibly important to us as human beings, to human flourishing, and we need to tell that story as well. And when we get right down to it, right, if we look just at Canada, animal ag is responsible for 4.5% of greenhouse gas emissions, again, accounting for methane in the way that we currently do. So we have a lot of opportunities to be a part of the climate solution in animal agriculture, and a lot of it's going to be focused on applying science, innovation, uh, best practices to our production systems and improving further and adding on those historical gains. So with that, I know this is uh, a recording, but I would just say thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Um, and if I'm able to make it in person, happy to take any questions as well. Mm -hmm.